Okay. Good afternoon. Those of you that have joined us, we had quite a few to register uh, to join us for our session today with the amazing Miss Pat Mitchell. So um, while we are waiting for others to join, um, I'd like to engage with some, some of you. Pat and I would like to know, um, where are you um, dialing in from? If you could click the chat button and hit all panelists and attendees. And I will go first. I will say hello, Sheila. And today I'm in North Carolina. So if you could let Pat know who are some of you joining us. And oh, Jackie in Berkeley, Rhonda, <laughs> Atlanta, uh, Leslie in San Francisco, Leslie, yeah. Sophie from the UK, it's Tiffany. Tiffany Dallas, Georgia, Sherry Palo Alto, Deidre Sacramento, uh, who's that from Nashville? Sandy. Swetlana, you know I always have a hard time pronouncing your name, but I love you to death from Los Angeles. <laughs> Andrea in New York. Oh, we have someone from Bellingham, Washington. Uh, Co Colleen, Carrie from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Liza Columbus, Laura, Chicago. Olivia, New York, Susie, New Jersey. What uh, We have a wonderful group here today. And if I have missed anyone name, anyone's name, I apologize, but we don't wanna miss not one minute of hearing the voice from our trailblazing um, Pat Mitchell. So we're going to get started. Welcome to those of you that do not know me. My name is Dr. Sheila Robinson. I am the publisher and founder of Diversity Women Media, an organization that is focusing on celebrating you and providing you ideas, solutions, and resources to be your very best in your career and your personal life. We realized that once we were, um, you know, COVID-19 came about, we wanted to continue to uh, speak with our community and be there for you as we have. Mm -hmm. And we thought the most appropriate way was to have a uh, weekly uh, virtual sessions is so wonderful that we can continue to function virtually in spite of this. And we decided to call it moving forward because we are moving forward from the time our feet touch the floor, coming out of our bed, we're moving forward. When we move from one room to another, we're moving forward. And so we want to continue to move forward uh, mentally. And each week we bring to you a phenomenal leader that's gonna buy, bring you some ideas and solutions to increase your resilience, stay focused, mm -hmm. productive, and positive. So let's jump right in. Our special guest today is Pat Mitchell. Her topic is Rise Up for the Great Reset. Dangerous times call for dangerous women willing to embrace risk to create change. Now, mm -hmm. I have to give her a proper introduction because <laughs> she is one of my sheroes and um, she is the author of Becoming a Dangerous Woman, co-founder, curator, and host of TED Women. Not only that, she was the first female CEO of PBS television. She's an award-winning producer, former president um, uh, and CEO of PBS and CNN Productions. Emmy winning producer, as you can see that Emmy in the back of her with her wonderful Peabody Awards. Um, <laughs> she has, um, she's a groundbreaking executive that has been focused on elevating women's stories and increasing their representation everywhere. She's chair of the Sundance Institute and the Women's Media Center boards and a trustee of the B-Day movement, the Skoll Foundation and the Acumen Fund. She is an advisor to Participant Media and served as a congressional appointment to the American Museum of Women's History Advis uh, Advisory Council. Now, I mentioned that she's the author of Becoming a Dangerous Woman, Embracing Risk to Change World, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that you know, uh, throughout her session. But I also wanna say I am honored that she is a recipient of the 2019 
Mosaic Woman Trailblazing Award, which you can see behind her. <laughs> and what I am thrilled to see is that the Mosaic Award that Ver Diversity Woman presented her is adjacent to her Emmy and her Peabody. <laughs> so help me. I love that uh, painting, Sheila. Thank you so much. Help me welcome to the stage Pat Mitchell, uh, an amazing and trailblazing woman. And we're going to start right off by asking Pat, I mean, talking about the book. What sparked you to write the book, Becoming a Dangerous Woman? And what is a dangerous woman? Mm -hmm. I began the book originally so that my grandchildren might know something about my life as they right. kept asking me questions like, were you really ever on television? Or, <laughs> so, um, and I realized that a lot of the barriers that I had faced and the challenges I had faced throughout my uh, life's journey were still existing for women today. So as I began to write a memoir, I realized it's not so much a memoir, although I do share my personal stories, because that's the way we always have, right, Sheila? I mean, that's yeah. the way women survive and thrive from generation to generation. So it, it had that, but I also realized it was more. It was more about the connections that we as women sustain in our lives and how we learn from each other by knowing how someone else survived. Mm -hmm. a situation or got around a challenge or pursued an opportunity or took a risk. And as I was writing it, um, fighting my own um, inhibitions and reluctance to write my own story, I started interviewing other women about where they were in their lives, women of all ages. And what I found is that we were all responding differently to the times we were living in, which we all believed were dangerous times. And they've only gotten more dangerous since yeah. I wrote the book. Um, and sitting around in a circle one day with a lot of activists that you probably know, um, everyone was saying, what can we do? What can we do? How can we organize? How can we connect? How can we be together more and collectively act? Mm -hmm. And I heard myself say, well, I'm a dangerous woman, and uh, dangerous times call for dangerous women, and I'm a dangerous woman. And the fact is, at 77, I did feel like I had less to lose. I didn't have as much I had to prove. So maybe that gave me the freedom to speak out more, to say what I was really thinking and feeling more often. I love it. But I then found out that it wasn't about age. Mm -hmm. I found girls at 16, like Greta Thunberg and my friend Jane Fonda at 82. You know, at every end, women and girls were stepping up to a new level of activism. So what I mean by dangerous mm -hmm. is being fearless, not fearful. That's particularly true now during this time of fear. Mm -hmm. Speaking the truth when silence is a lot safer and silence kept us um, in situations of, of abuse. Mm -hmm. And then more importantly, going forward to speak out against injustice every time we see it, mm -hmm. to speak up when the people we know should be in every room and at every table aren't there and insist that they are. And then my most important uh, element for me of danger because I believe it will make the biggest difference is supporting each other. If we are always there for each other, advocating, mentoring, sponsoring, being the friends, whatever is needed, that is the biggest change lever that we can collectively um, enact. I absolutely love that. You know, there are a lot of women on this call with me, on uh, on this call, and and we are feeling powerless. You know, COVID nineteen has us feeling powerless right now. Um, we are all living under, and and that's what I call it. When you know there are uncertain times. You know, my question for you: How do we become dangerous women? willing to embrace risk to create change during this time. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the thing that um, you, you thought of for this audience. And I would love for you to speak to that. 
you know, in a time of fear and, and confusion and now this uh, extraordinary contagion that has, you know, changed everything about the way we're living and working, I see a big opportunity that is already being realized around the world, which is the one thing that we all know now is we just can't go on with business as usual. We just can't keep the same processes in place, the same systems in place. We can't keep the same power syndrome, the same people in power, the same people in leadership. And into that reset, which is going to be necessary across the board, come women, come women leaders. We look around the world, what, where are the countries doing the best? Where are the countries that have the most strategic, the most effective, the best COVID-19 responses? Countries led by women. So the world has noticed that. So that's a good thing. Now we can point and say, let's don't talk about those women leaders that you didn't think le you know, measured up. Let's look at now. Because what's happening is, in my opinion, that makes us really ready, prepared for this opportunity. We've always had to be more flexible, always. I mean, with, between children and husbands and partners and, and, and balancing all those things in our lives, we have learned how to be flexible, how to embrace change, how to face change and deal with it. Um, we're by nature, compassionate, empathetic, willing to collaborate, seeking consensus. And then I find we are more and more prepared to be decisive, to make urgent action and to stick with it. So uh, the very things that I admire about women that I know and have seen lead in very critical situations before, I'm seeing all of that come full bloom now uh, mm -hmm. as women are stepping into the leadership. And if we can be at the places, at the tables where decisions are going to be made now, about what business looks like, what the economy looks like, how we work, how we live, how we balance life and family and work and ambitions, how we make sure every girl gets to realize her potential, how we protect the planet. All these things are being reset mm -hmm. during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Women can lead in that reset because we're very prepared to do so. That's a great example. You know, one of our dear friends that we share, uh, Tina Clark and Michelle LeClaire, I, I noticed how she had to reset with a, um, um, a cosmetic company she was bringing to the market. And when this hit, she reached out to her manufacturers and um, it, a lot took place. But now they are have turned that into, uh, she, uh, Michelle has turned that into an organization that is providing um, hand sanitizer. And so that's a great example of how a woman has reset during these times. And I know mm -hmm. you know a lot of people. Is this anything that you can think of, uh, an example of someone else that you know that has done something incredible to reset that we, can, we might can use as an example? Um, I think this is a, a time while you're thinking, I think this is a time that we can educate ourselves and, um, you know, the, the, we turn this powerlessness into power when we educate ourselves and, you know, do something, for example, I, um, you know, I wish that I could make masks in my, my living room, but I couldn't. So the first thing that I did was, you know, I donated to um, the Make a Million Masks. But, mm -hmm. you know, what are some stories or anything that you, that comes to mind to you of, of, of women that just hit the reset button and kept moving forward? Well, I, I see it with all the women that uh, I know, I mean, including Michelle, some of the resets are small. Uh, like I'm, I'm going to devote this much of my time every day to working in a food kitchen, or I'm going to make sure my neighbors have what they want. I've seen women juggling already with homeschooling and everything else, making those kind of decisions and doing it to very big 
um, initiatives that I've seen women leaders step up to seize the opportunity to do. Um, I've been focusing a lot on climate because one of the things that this pandemic has certainly shown us conclusively is that it is connected to climate yeah. and the crisis. And so we already had that emergency of a planet that was not going to serve, we were not going to survive on a planet that we had exploited and abused. But how to get people to change behavior was always the challenge. Well, what's happened in these last few weeks is a complete change in our behavior in every way. Uh, we did it instantly. We, we instantly went into our homes and started sheltering safely. We stayed within our bubbles to protect ourselves and others. So we, we changed our behavior. The result, clearer blue skies, birds are returning to my uh, trees out front. Uh, every possible way we see the earth restoring herself. Now, how do we keep that behavior going forward? So I've seen a lot of women who didn't think of themselves as climate activists. Uh, in fact, I, I was one of them. But now seeing, okay, we, we have an opportunity here to change our personal behavior, mm -hmm. which I've begun to do, and I see a lot of friends doing the same, but also to, to work towards different kinds of solutions, just solutions, the solutions that are inclusive. So I've done several programs, as you know, on climate justice because it isn't just enough to uh, reduce carbon emissions if we raise something else that just creates another challenge for a vulnerable community. So if we can look at everything now from a, a more level playing field, one that says we can't have a solution that doesn't equally serve every community. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic has pointed out that the vulnerable communities to everything every emergency are also the vulnerable communities to COVID-19. So whatever solutions we come forward with now as leaders, as climate justice or whatever our food security, all of the many issues that are surfacing, I see women saying, I have an idea. Here's an opportunity I can step forward with. And I believe out of this, women will be in leadership positions because they have decided to run for office, serve on the school board. They made some decisions that maybe they weren't gonna make before, but now they realize how much is at stake and what a difference they can make. You know, that is a perfect example of how we can turn this adversity into opportunity. And, wow. and you know, everything you just shared, and that's what it's all about, turning adversity into uh, opportunity. To eat. But I know as women still, we're always afraid that sometimes that we take risks, that, you know, we, we don't want to take risks out of fear of failure. And um, it's so much can come out of turning adversity into uh, uh, um, this, these, this adversity into opportunity. Because first of all, it is really true when you take the focus off of your situation and help somebody else, you, you know, you eliminate some of those fears. How, yeah. What would you share with some of the women on this that say, you know what? I have an idea, I would love to reset and do this, or I have an idea, I would love to take this in my organization. What are some ideas about um, to, that you could share with us to some of us that might be afraid to take, to take the risk out of fear of failing? Well, you know, I think we all fear uh, taking risk and risk has a, a really uh, loaded meaning right now because risk can, it can be dealing with a, a virus that, that you know, can be uh, devastating and even deadly. So, but risk for me, as a young child, I became a risk taker very early because risk for me just meant getting outside of other people's expectations for me. And a lot of us, especially as girls, grow up with all these expectations that other people half of the way we're going to live our lives. So I had to take risk to break out of those boundaries. And I suspect every woman on this call today has done the same. And to do it uh, takes courage, yes, but it also takes knowing that we're going to get up again if we fall. Right. If we fail, it's probably the biggest step we could take towards success. 
you know, as my grandmother used to say, when you fall on your face, it's at least a forward movement. Yes. And it's true. So every time I would take a risk and it wouldn't work out, like with a job or whatever, um, I'd remember her words and it would inspire me. And sure enough, she was right. I would move forward. But in this, this kind of time, women have the opportunity to, I think, speak up about things that have been wrong and unjust and not equal for a very long time and try and use this opportunity of adversity to make those our new platforms of action. Equal pay for equal work. We have, we have just got to insist on that. We cannot go into any other emergency. Actually, we can't go into any kind of life beyond this emergency in which women are still 75% of the caregivers and are making 25% of the funds, the money. I, that can't happen. Actually, if you add in mothers, we're 95% mm-hmm. uh, of the caregivers in the world. So equal pay for equal work. Getting companies to look at what we've learned in a positive way, working like this. Yes. How can that go back into our companies? Many companies are seeing that uh, it might make sense to let particularly working mothers uh, work this way. And women are certainly proving they can, aren't they? Exactly. <laughs> My, I, have, I have a daughter-in-law who's, you know, educating three children under the age of 12 and running a full-time job from her kitchen or her office, you know. And she's just one of hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions of women doing the same balancing act. Um, but going back in with a different level of resolve, that even if it feels risky, I'm going to do, I'm going to speak up about this. I'm going to be the one who leads the action. I'm going to be the one who puts forward a new platform. I think that's the kind of um, activism that I feel is going to come out of this adversity. I, I love you saying that. And, you know, it reminds me of our theme for this webinar, Moving Forward. We as women can't afford to take not one step backwards. Not that's one. Step not one step backwards. We cannot look back. And Mm -hmm. I I agree. I love what your grandmother said, because we cannot be fearful of failing. Uh, One thing I always tell myself when I'm taking a risk, it's either going to be a lesson or a blessing. It's either the blessing will be a victory or the lesson is I'm going to learn what I did. And, you know, and just. Yeah, Sheila, can I just add one thing to that too? Um, At the beginning of the pandemic, you may have read, and I'm sure the women who are with us today did, a lot of leaders were stepping forward and saying, you know, this is a time of a global healthcare crisis. Mm -hmm. We can't talk about gender. This is not the time to bring up gender. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the time to bring up gender. Because if we haven't had testimonials in every aspect of our lives now to the value of inclusiveness and to the value of equality, we're never going to get it. I mean, we we can't we can't be um, complacent about a world that has the kind of disproportionate impact on vulnerable communities that this pandemic does. Because it's just it's another striking example of the injustice that exists when you allow inequality to exist and when you allow uh, communities to not be inclusive and diverse. So I I think the, you know, there'll be risk, yes, but I think there'll be even more opportunity for us to to speak up from our values and show how, how much they are needed in the economy. Economic reset is so essential. We can't have an economy based on profits for a few and uh, not enough exactly. for all the rest. We just, we can't have an, a global economy that works that way or it will crash mm-hmm. over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. So resetting the economy, got to have women's voices, yeah. women's values there. Same now, thing, every level of our lives. Exactly. Now, Pat is inspiring us on how to become dangerous women. I hope you all are <laughs> taking note. And, you know, which brings me to 
leading as a dangerous woman. Now that we've talked about eliminated those fears, rolling our sleeves up, getting out there to do the work. Many of us lead teams. You know, many of us have teams that are going to be looking to us to um, lead the way, um, especially when it's time to go back and to the workplace. I know that what's most important, especially for women of color and women who um, um, some of the uh, the, the, the cultural um, um, uh, individuals that are uh, uh, demographics of individuals who are more susceptible susceptible to COVID-19, we have to make sure that when the workplace opens back up, that our teams feel safe and they feel uh, protected and they have transparent leadership. So what are some ideas uh, or, or ways or anything that you would share with us of how, not only how we must lead our teams as women, but the importance of women supporting other women? There's nothing more important in my mind, um, Sheila, had we been doing this all along, we would be much, much further along in terms of our pathways to the positions of leadership and power. We can't actually do it without each other. And when you, I'm often asked as an American woman, and I imagine you are too, how is it that American women have the right to vote for a hundred years only, but that we've never elected a top leader in this country. And, and I don't accept that that's not going to happen in my lifetime, although we're going to have to rush it. <laughs> that's for sure. But I am encouraged when I see 10,000 women under the age of uh, 40 in the midterms running for elections, stepping up, saying, we, we can't wait for somebody to give us power. So in an, and I, I realize I'm talking about um, the no, no, no. This is relevant in this country. I, I where are you going? Uh, but, but it, it because I know we have people from many other countries, and there are so many better examples around the world than the U.S., which I would, is definitely not the best example of of leadership, or, and certainly not um, the best example of unifying its its women's population. But what I've seen women do, and I'm watching it now more and more, is we do have these, the innate attribute of wanting consensus. We have to, we, we have to do it in our families and we tend to be the consensus builders at work. But we lead toward consensus. That's my experience. And by the way, that's documented in all the data and research, as you know. Um, we also lead toward collaborative actions. So if we have these natural inclinations, adding in empathy, compassion, all those other nice things that, that we have naturally, yes. and if we, if we have the, uh, a natural tendency to collaborate, cooperate, lead to consensus, within our teams, if we are truly supporting each other within those teams, that becomes a very powerful force for change. And keeping our teams motivated and believing mm -hmm. that together we can make those changes is how we start to shift that paradigm away from two important barriers in my mind. One of them is the scarcity theory. That, that theory that we hear from little girls forward. It's not much room at the top. So you better protect your own turf. Make mm -hmm. sure your space is okay. Um, mm -hmm. Don't bring in allies. Don't be friends at work. Don't mentor other women because there's not very much room at the top. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of room at the top. We just got to push some people out of the way right? <laughs> and prove that we are better. And I don't mean push in a, an aggressive way. I just mean uh, the people who have power have been defining it for a very long time. There's a different way of defining leadership and power. And I think women can do that. I believe that so strongly. So we can't do it alone. And I, when I see women who've had to fight every way up to get to um, to fulfill their ambitions and to do it without the support of other women. It's very hard to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and many of us had to do it because that was the way of the world before. Gratefully, there are more numbers of us now. So with more numbers at every level in our businesses, and we support each other on those moves, every time we go up the ladder, dropping the ladder to the person coming behind us, advocating for that person for the next promotion, it starts to look different. And the top starts to look very different. Um, but it won't happen. One, it won't happen one by one. It is happening one by one. That's why it's too slow. Yeah. <laughs> it has to happen uh, with all of us working together and, and really, really looking around for the opportunities for each other and saying, ah, I know Sheila. She'd be perfect for that. Or I'm going to advocate for so-and-so. And, and, and becoming that advocate and mentor. That's awesome, Pat. So I'm, we're um, a little over, um, we're past halfway through the show. So we're going to open up the Q&A. And I have some questions that you have sent in. But while uh, we open up the Q&A for you all to type, please type in uh, any questions you may have for Pat. I want to talk a little bit about her success. And I can say I'm reading the chat. It's so interesting. I wish I had time to respond to everyone. Oh. But one of them that just strikes me because it, it's what I've been trying to say. And she says it so beautifully, so quickly. You know, we have a need to operate with an abundance mindset mm -hmm. rather than scarcity. And that says it so much better than what I was trying to say. But that is what I was trying to say. There is an abundance abundance of opportunity I think coming out of this more than ever mm -hmm. and if we don't if we operate from let's do it together let's get it together the abundance mindset I think there's no question we'll be successful all right so um if you have a question uh let's see hi Tiffany from Atlanta mm. um I see a lot in the chat. If you could put your question in the Q and A, um, I want to talk a little bit about your success and what made me think of this. You becoming the first president of PBS. You talked about how, in order for us to witness in our mm -hmm. lifetime the first president of the USA, that women are really going to work together and work hard and you know, and, and be there and make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, you were a first, you know, and, and I share a little bit about your success and how brave you were. And, and during that time, it had to be very difficult to become that first of, you know, of a, a PBS television. That's amazing. So if you would talk a little bit about your success and share some things with us that could resonate with us today. When I think back to some of the very first interviews that I had when I became president of PBS and there had not been a woman, you know, they were typical of the things you hear and lots of people on this call here. Are you going to lead like a woman? Um, what will you do differently because you're a woman? Wow. Uh, you know, if you're the first person who looks like you or who is of your gender, you're going to get an awful lot of undue criticism and undue uh, attention. There's just no question about it. Um, but I, I used to, uh, and, I, and I think we all went through a period of time, especially my generation, where we felt like, oh, if they say women can't anchor the news, then we have to look as much like the men anchoring as we possibly can. So we wore ugly suits and ties that look like scarves and you know, did the whole thing. That doesn't work. Because it, well, when it started to work is when we started to be ourselves on the air. So when I was president and I was getting challenged a lot about that, um, oh, are you hiring those seven people you just hired because you're a woman and five of the seven are women? I decided to stop being defensive about it and to just say, as a matter of fact, yes. yes. It's my strategy. It's my priority to be to create an inclusive workplace while looking for the very best people. So I, did, I became more comfortable with saying, I am a leader, I am a woman leader. And I believe that when we get to that place where we can say, I'm bringing everything that I am, a mother, a grandmother, a sister, a wife, all the things, a partner, all the things that make up who we are, 
if I bring all of that to my decision making, it's going to be better. Awesome. Then if I sit there and try and think, mm, I better not answer that. I might answer it like a woman. Or should I put that picture of my child? Oh, no, that would be, you know, I mean, there are, these are the kind of questions that frankly have kept us back. They've really kept us back. Uh, in my, I'm, a, I'm a, just a great believer, as you can tell, that what we bring when we bring our full selves as women is something the world needs. Mm -hmm. And that means, in my opinion, every business needs it, every social enterprise needs it. Um, I'm not saying instead of men, it's really important to say that. I'm just saying that we bring something different right. to every situation. And it's especially important in decision-making positions that our perspective and the perspective of communities who are often not in those conversations is represented. Because if we're, if not, look where we are. I mean, that's what led us to these, these times uh, is having a single kind of power paradigm, a single kind of leadership. Uh, you know, all, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't led us where we need to go and it won't lead us to a better future. And Pat, you know, now that we, we have proof now, as a result of your success and many others like you, we now have proof. You know, if they want peer reviews, we can provide we it. We, we have, have it. it. Yeah. And I love that you said for the women that bringing our authentic selves, that we no longer have to fear being like someone else that we bring to the table who we right. are, that's proven leadership. And the eight women that led countries that have navigated through COVID, yeah. more proof. And so day after day, we, are, we have the proof that we need and not to be afraid to move forward as a leadership. We do have a few questions. I'm gonna tell us how we are on time. You know, I want you all to stick with us and know that this is being recorded because Pat has a few announcements at the end. She wanna share with you some things that she's doing and how you can keep up with her. So stay connected. So uh, I'm gonna go right into a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, well, Andrea, this is, uh, she, she's, she's agreeing with you how life, um, how wonderful life is now with the abundance of wildlife life. She's mm -hmm. also seeing the birds and the bees. Um, how can we influence industry to maintain COVID levels of pollution on the other side of COVID? Not, not saying that you know the answer to this, but your opinion would be appreciated. Uh, but that is right. You know, when people say, okay, we are on the other side of COVID, we're going back to business as usual. Yeah. How, do we, how do we sustain some of this yeah. beauty that has come out of it? Yeah, it is going to be very tempting for everyone to rush back to what was normal. But I, I am the, I believe, and I think everyone is saying the same thing. We can't go back. There is no normal. There has to be a new normal. And the new normal has to take into account that we won't survive on this planet if we continue to abuse it and to exploit it in the way we have. So one of the things we can do uh, and we can't do this, is we can start to pay attention to when there are these big gatherings that are making policies that govern those mining companies, those gas companies, those oil companies, the companies that are mining and exploiting the earth and raising the CO2 levels, we can have impact there. Look, look at what the um, Indian nations did at Standing Rock. I mean, they stood there until they got that mining closed down. Now, regrettably, it's gone back. Mm -hmm. they, there are people mining right now on Indian lands during COVID, by the way, which is unforgivable, uh, in my opinion. And I want to remind everyone that it was women who got the Paris Agreement negotiated. We don't know that because they did it like women do, often behind the scenes, Christiana Figueres, Mary Robinson, all these women leaders, women from Africa, women from the global South, women from Asia, meeting together 
behind the scenes going, okay, you take that one, I'll take this one, you take that one, do it the way women do, you know, you go talk to that guy, you go talk to that guy. And they're the ones who got the agreement done. It was not going to happen. Wow. If you read the books about what went on in Paris or, or it, it, what, and we were all unaware you know, so I'm just saying that whatever it is, if you are reading in your local paper or online or whatever, wherever you get your news, and you see that there is a policy being made by a legislature or a city or whatever, stand up and speak out against it. That's how it all starts. It often starts with one voice, as we know. But now I think you're going to find a lot more voices energized around the subject of sustainability, around the subject of economic inequity, around the subject of food security. We are seeing all these things come forward now and realizing we can't have a, we can't have a world we want to live in or leave to our children and grandchildren unless we, women, step forward to leadership. Pat, it's just so amazing. You, you, you have um, the opportunity to meet and work with so many people. I want to talk a little bit about the, the global work you've been doing. I mean, it's incredible where I saw you, you, you know, with TED Women, uh, what you've been doing globally. Can you share a little bit about that? And then Crystal, uh, while she's sharing the information, we can lead into that slide about what she's going to do with Mother's Day. I mean, I love the fact that you've been doing these global conferences all over the world. We want to hear a little bit about that. Well, my, what I'm doing is, is based on my belief that I've said several times today that women connected is a powerful force. And we have to be connected, not just in our communities and in our cities and, and counties, whatever, but globally. Because pandemic has certainly proven beyond any doubt we are a global, interconnected world. So let's use that connectivity as women leaders to know what each other's doing and support each other. So I put together a group called Connected Women Leaders. It's a cohort that gets bigger and bigger because we just keep inviting more women leaders in as they, they say, I want to sign up for the problem solving. And when we get together in these forums, we're problem solving. If it's climate justice, which we did last week, we're going to do one on global health in two weeks with women who are leading the global health response to COVID all over the world and are stepping up and saying, this isn't working. We've got to change this. People are dying. So I'm trying, I'm identifying the women who are doing the work and then connecting them to each other so they can learn from each other and support each other. Um, so that, that's been just wonderful work for me. I love it. And in, in that work, I've met some women doing extraordinary things, everything from negotiating peace and climate um, to the Solar Mamas. Can I talk a little bit about them? Yes. Um, you have yeah. a slide, Crystal? Yes. Yeah. And this, this comes from my work with a group of leaders in India. They're a group of women who are from poor, illiterate, um, uneducated women in, in rural villages were taught to become solar mamas. They were taught how to engineer solar panels so that they could go back to their communities, wherever they were from, and they were from 91 different countries, wow. go back to their communities and villages that had no power, no electricity. And here they come, the solar mamas with their solar panels and their knowledge. And wow. they electrify their villages. They have electrified 12,000 villages that had no light or power before. And we call them solar mamas because they're all grandmothers. And they are select, yeah, because grandmothers are no longer doing the day-to-day -day child rearing usually. Um, so in every culture, every village, you'll find very active women, and grandmothers are often in their 40s and 50s, as you know, it's not about age. Anyway, they, so this group brings them to India, they educate, it's all free, they educate them, and the, the women do wonderful things while they're there, as well as becoming solar engineers, and they did this beautiful um, fabric Sorry, work with, with, uh, sorry, my phone is talking to me. 
um, they uh, they knit, they make this cashmere. It's cashmina actually from the uh, the sheep and the goats that they raise there at Barefoot College. The place that trains them is called Barefoot College, and it's called Barefoot College because uh, it it came out of a, a culture of rural communities. Mm -hmm. So they made these for me to sell on the um, Becoming a Dangerous Woman merchandise. And the Becoming a Dangerous Woman merchandise is all made by women, all designed by women, and all and manufactured by women-led companies, Sheila. Now that was a challenge, finding women-led companies in this country who manufactured the things we were making, but we found them. That was my prerequisite, has to be. Um, and then all the proceeds go back to the nonprofits that I talk about in the book. So for Mother's Day, I'm doing a special offering of these pashmina scars that have a tiny little hand embroidered dangerous on them, which is very subtle. So, and they come in variations of colors. Um, and those, it, for people who might want to buy them as a Mother's Day gift, the money 100% goes back to those women who made those scarves and who are also solar engineers. So it, it allows them to train another woman to become a solar engineer. So oh the, the, the all, all of, And yeah. all the proceeds go back. I oh, just think what Mary said, I'm buying one for all wonderful mothers in my life. So do we have, where do they go to to purchase They go that? to, yeah, I hope we have a slide. It's um, shop. B -A -B. Crystal, can you put up the other slide? The, the, I think the, the last one you had, Crystal, um, before, I think that's the one that has the address. Yeah, there, there we go. It's at the bottom, shopbadw.com. And there's a lot of merchant, I mean, not a lot. There are about 14 items. They're all designed by women, uh, manufactured by women. And then the proceeds from everything go back to the, um, to the nonprofits. But I decided for Mother's Day, I really wanted to focus on these solar mamas. I wanted to raise awareness of the different, they, they are, as I said, rural uneducated women who have now transformed their communities, not just because they can put solar panels up, but because they have a confidence and they go back as leaders. Many of them have gone back and gotten elected as mayors or, you know, whatever, They're because they go back believing in their own power. And that, that's really what it's all about. This is outstanding. So we have about 10 minutes left, but let's leave that slide up because as you can see, you can follow Pat on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and, and visit her shop. I'm going to go back to the Q&A. So if you have a Q&A, we're going to spend the last um, few minutes uh, with some of the questions that uh, you on the call have asked. So Mary is saying with so few women at the top positions and in the room where it all happens, how can we ensure that post COVID-19 women are not set back 50 years? This keeps me up at night. Women are really suffering at so many levels during this pandemic. How are we going to come out of this stronger and not defeated? Can we design something similar to a GI bill post World War II, a women's bill that helps women rebuild? You know, that's not a bad idea. Okay. That's a really good idea, Mary, wherever you are, wherever you work, um, think about putting that idea forward. That, that's a really good idea. I think we're going to come out, I, I mean, I, I, I sometimes wake up at night with that same worry that will this put us back because we'll have so many other challenges to face. But I am holding forth uh, with the faith that what women are doing during this pandemic from the caretaking and the caregiving all the way to the leaders of those countries who are proving that they are doing it differently and it's working. So we're going to have a lot more data points, a lot more evidence that when women are at the table, mm -hmm. are in a position of power, are mm -hmm. in a position of leadership, they make a difference. They make a positive difference. We're going to have more evidence of that not less. So if we just keep putting that forward over and over again, 
people would not be alive in any community today if it were not for the 75% of the caregivers on the front lines risking their lives are women. Are we taking care of them? We have got to going forward. We've got to support our nurses and caregivers. And then all the other ways that we're seeing women step up to leadership. Uh, and as Sheila mentioned earlier in the in this conversation, to resetting our own priorities, to changing what we are doing um, so that we are fully taking advantage of every opportunity to show what a difference women leadership can make and what we individually and collectively can do together. And, I, and there are a lot more male allies out there that are supporting us. There are a lot more um, male allies who are about winning and not about themselves. And I, you know, and I, I agree with Pat that we have a much better chance of not moving backwards in this day and time because of some of the things she just shared and because of that. And so what we need to work on is our, uh, our own personal fears and, uh, and, and making sure that we're ready when it's time for the opportunity to present itself. I think that I'm going to end this. And Sheila, can I just say one thing about that? Because I don't want it to appear as if I'm saying women leaders in every position instead of men, women leaders with men. With men. Uh, we have to build allies. We have to have alliances. And there again, when we're our, our authentic selves, we're really good at it. Mm -hmm. We really, you know, we know how to do that to build alliance. And we can't do it without men and we don't want to do it without men. We want to do it together with each other, supporting each other, and with men as our allies. And, and we just have to, and, and Pat, everything you said is, is exactly right. We just have to make sure that we are cautious and, and careful and, and make sure that we are, you know, looking at an ally and, and, and not an enemy because that, that still exists. That's why we have the barriers, the roadblocks now is because it is still hard because mm -hmm. of some of the things that are in place there to stop us. So mm -hmm. let's end it on a note on self-care. I've taken this time, I mean, you know, instead of, I would have thought, the old Sheila would have thought, you know, I'm going to be curled up with books and, and television shows and, and whatever, but I've really taken this time to focus on how can I better take care of myself. Um, I, I, I used to trip over suitcases and I, I, could, I could never, I was traveling so much that I was using two and three suitcases because I hadn't taken time to unpack one before it was time for me to take a trip on another. On another. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm not the only one like that. And so this part of this reset is not just about career and family, but how are we resetting? How do we need to reset and take care of ourselves mm -hmm. with hot baths, getting lavender for smells or, you know, what is the way that we can self-care, focus on, prioritize ourselves personally? Well, you know, this was a challenge for me because like you, uh, I had three or four suitcases packed all the time. I don't think I've ever been in them in my house here lo as long as I have been now consistently. Um, so the I, I, th that was just part of my life and my world. I live aerobically, uh, as my grandchildren like to say. Um, but I have tried during this time uh, to think about to, to go into a space where I could think more deeply. I spend a lot of time like this because for me, connection matters in every way. I have to feel it and I have to have it. I will never be able to. Connection empowers me and inspires me. Um, so I'm not, and I'm not meditating. I am trying to do uh, walks every day with my mask and things that I know are important to do right now. Um, but I'm really focused on what, what we're going to look like on the other side of this. And what I want the world to look like on the other side of this is one that just looks like a lot more like the world that I know can be here for my children and grandchildren, a world that values you and me and all the women on this call as equally and as 
highly as they value anything in their lives or work, uh, and perhaps more, since we have proven our value uh, so greatly. And that, you know, we think of this as a time of risk, yes, danger, yes, but really big opportunities to change the world that can be afterwards. I'm envisioning that future and I'm moving towards it. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. Um, the last, one of the last things in the, um, the chat is beautiful from Mary. She says, thank you for that. You continue to inspire me to persist and share women's stories and make sure women's voices are heard and with men who support women. And, and so we thank you, Deidre. Hi, Deidre said, this has been awesome. Oh, well, thanks. this is just the beginning. I'm going to be following Pat around. I'm going to try to keep her in the graces. We want to feature her on the cover of Diversity Woman. Ooh. We want her to, uh, you know, attend our Diversity Woman's um, Leadership Virtual Conference in the fall. So we, we, we're going to continue to stay engaged with Pat, but I ask and urge you to stay engaged with her. Follow her on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I know that I am. And shop, um, uh, shop, the shop, B-A-D-W.com. I actually have one of her t-shirts that I purchased <laughs> about becoming a dangerous woman. The one that says ready to risk, uh, uh, impatient for change. Yes, yes. <laughs> So, That's me, ready to risk and patient for change. <laughs> so we're getting lots of thank yous and um in, in the in the chat. Okay. And Pat, let, I'll let you have the final word and we'll sign off. What is your final word? Ooh, well, uh, my final word is uh is that become a dangerous woman and stand together with each other, ready for risk and patient for change. All right. Thank you so much. And you have a wonderful day. And Thanks. you as well. Thank you, and I hope to see you all next week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sheila. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.